Are you doing this? Yeah. Continue the That's it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, for numerous uh, works on the French Revolution and 18th century France. Including Choosing Terror, Virtue, Friendship, and Authenticity in the French Revolution. That was published by OUP. Currently working on a further book for OUP, which is on Danton, Robespierre, Demain, and Saint Just. So, four leaders of the revolution. But uh, tonight, my, my principal subject is. Robespierre himself. So over the 220 years since his death, Maximilien Robespierre has continued to generate controversy for his role in the traumatic circumstances of the French Revolutionary Terror. Historians have repeatedly sought to find in Robespierre's personality and motivation a means to explain the terror. Great, okay. This is he. So, um, one of the questions that we might ask ourselves, did he destroy the revolution? Was he, was he the, the sort of the mastermind behind the terror who took the French Revolution off course? Or rather, was he a person who was well-intentioned, who was destroyed by the, the, sort of the titanic uh, effect of revolutionary politics? That's something we might think about. Now, historians have always taken very strong views about Robespierre. Many of them are negative, and some historians simply dislike him. So Richard Cobb, for example, uh, once at Balliol, said of Robespierre that there is no historical personage I find more repellent, save possibly Saint-Just. Uh, Ruth Skirn wrote a biography of Robespierre, which she entitled Fatal Purity, uh, attributes his difficulties to this very same fatal purity. And despite, despite claiming she would try to be his friend and see things from his point of view, settled on a rather unfriendly judgment, calling him a mediocre figure, strutting and fretting on the historical stage, lonely and eccentric and remarkably odd. And I think with friends like that, who needs enemies, really? Other historians, less personally antagonistic, nevertheless depict Robespierre as the man who held the reins of power in 1793 to 1794, an incipient dictator. So John Hardman, who wrote a short book on Robespierre, uh, says on the 8th of Thermidor, just before his fall, Robespierre was asking for a further centralisation of power in the hands of the Committee of Public Safety, purged of its enemies, a formal dictatorship. And this is the charge that has been made repeatedly against Robespierre. Uh, a very recent uh, work by Jonathan Israel takes us even further in uh, his, his latest book, of many, this one's called Revolutionary Ideas, uh, describes Robespierre as conducting a putsch, that's the word uh, Israel uses, to overthrow the uh, Girondin deputies, uh, and describes the fall of the Ebertis and the Dantonis as strengthening what Israel calls the Robespierre dictatorship, dishonest, hypocritical, and Cromwellist to the core. And on a personal level, uh, Israel also speaks of Robespierre's megalomania, paranoia, and vindictiveness. So, and these are just samples. He's had a very bad press, shall we say. Uh, but such narratives owe much to the Thermidorian fabrication of the myth of Robespierre. So the Thermidorians are the people who overthrew him. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to patronise anybody, but uh, you're not, you know, yeah, okay. The, 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 the group really of his own people, like Jacobin deputies who overthrew him, and become known as the Thermidorians because they do it in the month of Thermidor, of the revolutionary calendar. But recently there have been some more positive reappraisals of uh, Robespierre, and in particular three biographical works that take a much more positive slant. These include biographies by Peter McPhee, the Australian historian, and two French historians, Hervé Lervers and jean Clément Martin. McPhee and Lervers emphasise uh, Robespierre's early years and his legal formation, and McPhee also emphasises Robespierre's physical and psychological ill health in the last months of his life, which is a controversial subject we can talk about later if you like. Mata and Lervers also emphasise the degree to which argue of Robespierre as a monster was constructed by the Thermidorians who overthrew him. So Robespierre still generates endless biographies. I find it curious, actually, that he's the one French revolutionary that everyone's heard of. I mean, everyone. Uh, even people who play that game, Assassin's Creed, which possibly not anybody here knows, but <laughs> students often do, okay? They know who Robespierre is. He's a character in a computer game. Uh, and he remains an endlessly intriguing but difficult subject. There are no significant new sources, however. Uh, the papers that surfaced in 2012, of which you might have heard of, were interesting, but they didn't contain anything that historians had, had not already had uh, an awareness of. 
So, is there anything new that can be said about Robespierre? Well, I think there is. And in my talk today, what I'll do is line up in the more positive cap. I will put my cards on the table straight away. But I will do so by taking a particular focus. Whilst many works have uh, concentrated on Robespierre, the individual, and his, or his childhood, his personality, his psychology, <coughs> to construct an argument about his impact on the French Revolution, I take a different view. <coughs> in a sense, I think this is back to front. I think that Robespierre is important not for his particular personality so much as because he was part of the French Revolution. And this is the thing that makes Robespierre special. Therefore, if we want to better understand Robespierre, the best, most helpful way to do so is by situating him back in the sea of revolutionary politics. And I think uh, this is... To me, it's the most hopeful way of understanding him and saying, you know, he was deprived because his mother died and his father ran off and all the kind of the psychological stuff, which was sad, but these things often happened to people in the ancien regime. They lost their parents at a young age, so how is that so different? Uh, you know, the different thing about Robespierre is that he was involved in revolutionary politics, and it's this politics that I want to explore. So today I'm going to put his ideas, his motives, his actions within this wider context of what I call the politician's terror, which engulfed the deputies in the National Convention. The National Convention was the assembly that started to meet in September 1792 and carried on right through the period of what is commonly known as the terror, so the convention. Right, the politician's terror is a term that... Oh, Mr. Max, this is really hopeless. Have we got windows? Use the arrow. Yeah, let's just, yeah, that's so wise. That one. Um, down one, okay. Thank you. Down one. Right. Okay. So, um, this image is from the cover of my latest book that I mentioned in 2013, Choosing Terror. And what it illustrates, in fact, is the night of Thermidor, the scenes in the National Convention when Robespierre uh, went to the convention and was denounced himself as a conspirator against the revolution. Uh, very traumatic scenes, and he, he's pictured here trying, I mean, this is a 19th century image, but he's pictured trying to get to the, uh, the rostrum to speak and not being allowed to do so. Now, in this book, I identified and used a term politician's terror. So this is something I'm going to speak about tonight. The politician's terror I define as the terror that revolutionary leaders meted out to one another. The revolutionary leaders were themselves subject to terror. This took two forms. Firstly, these revolutionary leaders were liable to arrest under the laws that enable terror. The successive laws removed their parliamentary immunity and criminalized the wrong political opinions. Secondly, they were subject to the emotion of terror. <coughs> that is, fears that they could not openly acknowledge because innocence was meant to be fearless, and fear was a sign of consciousness of guilt. Increased in intensity, above all during the critical period between March 1793 and July 1794, and this fear in turn influenced revolutionary leaders' choices. And ironically, these leaders had much more cause to fear the terror than most of the Parisian population. A high proportion of the leaders of the revolution, above all either those who were or had been members of the Jacobin Club, died violent deaths, either under the guillotine or by their own hand. The politicians' terror climaxed in a series of trials and executions of revolutionary leaders during the year two, that's September 1793 to 94. In a series of trials and executions, um, these groups uh, or factions who were killed include the Girondins, the Herbatistes, or sometimes they're known as the Cordeliers, and the Dantonis, and also executed without any form of trial beyond identification before the Revolutionary Tribunal, Robespierre and his group, uh, who become known as the Robespierreist. These trials of political factions were some of the most notorious of the Revolution. Despite this continued interest, the nature of these factional trials is not well understood. While the trials constituted a travesty of justice for the victims, which they absolutely did, they were also atypical of the processes of the Revolutionary Tribunal. The politicians' terror was characterised by a process often confused with or assimilated to the general terror, but which should actually be seen as distinct in many, though not all ways. And this is particularly important because the politicians' terror involved a series of trials in which justice played little part. 
And they're so often taken as emblematic of not just the terror as a whole, but also the whole revolutionary endeavor itself. So people point always particularly to the trial of Don Kong and General and say that this kind of typified the whole of the terror. Um, and what I'm arguing is that we should see the politicians' terror as distinct, with different origins, a different evolution, and a different structure. It was not the whole terror, nor even entirely typical of it. And the politicians' terror also persisted after the fall of Robespierre as deputies sought revenge for deaths of friends or their own imprisonment. So surviving friends of Danton uh, returning Girondin, for example. The politicians' terror derived much of its intellectual impetus from the belief that politicians should be men of virtue. Virtue is the subject of my first book, and I've talked about it a lot in the second. I've actually been talking about the subject now for longer than Robespierre, which really makes me think. <laughs> 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 okay. What this meant was that, as public officials, they should be devoted to the public good, not to their own self-interest. Above all, they must not be either financially or politically corrupt. They should not be motivated by personal ambition, egoism, the desire for glory, or the wish to acquire wealth and influence out of their office. So they were supposed to be the reverse of the archetype of the old regime courtier, who is portrayed as a consummate dissembler, corrupt, self-serving, conspiratorial, and cynical. And that's very important that they're seen as the opposite of the old regime courtiers, because this is their experience, and this is how they understand politics. So they're, they're supposed to be different to that. Belief in political virtue helped to inspire many of the extraordinary achievements of the revolution. But the politics of virtue would also prove to be deeply problematic and ultimately traumatic in its effects, not least for the revolutionary leaders themselves. The ideology of political virtue impacted on expectations regarding the conduct of revolutionary politicians. Now this image, I think many of you will be familiar with, Lictus bring to Brutus the bodies of his sons. And this was uh, painted by Jacques-Louis David, who was himself a Jacobin and a close friend of Robespierre, or became that. Uh, this was painted in 1789. Many of you will have seen it hanging in the Louvre, or you will be familiar with it. Now, what that depicts is... Um, are you familiar with it? Sorry, I'm still <laughs> yeah, yeah, assuming you all, yes. course you all know this one. <laughs> I didn't know David was a friend of Robespierre. Oh, I did yes. fine art. Oh. Shows you the, was he a friend? Oh, shows you what history of art mm. teaching yeah, yeah. is like. Yeah, they kind of wipe, they tried to wipe out David's uh, uh, unfortunate yes, uh, stint. In the Committee of General Security, uh, but yes, but yeah, this was but this was before any of that happened. What this depicts is uh, Lucius Junius Brutus, who has uh, just um, given the order for the execution of his own sons because he uh, found that they were conspiring to return the kings, the Tarquins, and therefore to overthrow the Roman Republic. Now, what you see in this painting is the body of the sons being brought back into the house after their execution. That's not bad, actually. Sometimes it comes a bit of a But you can see, yeah, their body's being brought in. This wouldn't have actually happened uh, in, in, in Roman antiquity because bodies were buried outside the, the city, which, of course, David knew. But this was about art and also about Voltaire's play. And anyway. So, but this is an artistic concept. So what you see on the right are the women folk, the mother of the, the dead boys and uh, sisters, and they're expressing all that natural grief and emotion, of devastation of this family, uh, catastrophe. And then on, sorry, on the, here you see uh, uh, Brutus himself, and he's turned away from his sons, and he holds in his hand the, uh, I don't know if you can see, his, his hand is clinch, clenched on a letter, which is the letter which is the proof of their, their conspiracy. And he um, is acting as a man of virtue. That is what a man of virtue does. Because he has put the public welfare beyond even his own sons, in this case. This is what a man of virtue does. And you can see the results, although good for the Roman Republic, are catastrophic. I think not just for his, the women folk, but also for him personally, because his body is contorted and his legs are twisted. And I think you can see David is showing that this is a man who, who knows that he's destroyed any personal happiness that he might have possessed. And I think that shows something of the, of the, the complexity of being a man of virtue and how very difficult it is. It's not an easy thing, and it's an absolutely 
traumatic thing in some way. It's a very interesting image. It also means that women can't be. I mean, women are... There's a whole thing about how you interp I, I interpret this painting in terms of the women who are bathed in light. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I mean, I could talk about women's virtue, but, um, but basically women are supposed to be more naturally virtuous. They wouldn't necessarily have had a classical classical education. Oh, so basically. their virtue is yeah yeah. So their virtue is more natural, comes from the heart, but then they don't have to have this hard virtue of being involved in politics. So they can express those emotions. Don't <laughs> uh, ask me about it afterwards, otherwise otherwise um, yeah. <laughs> Lucy Drift. <laughs> okay, I'll show you another image as well, um, which is from much later. Um, David again. Um, David's paintings of revolutionary martyrs showing authentic virtue proved by self-sacrifice and death. Because if you're a politician, how's anyone to know that you are truly virtuous? And this is the problem that so many politicians have. Can we trust them? Can we trust their words? Yeah, well, we laugh. We're cynical about it now. But in the revolution, because this was like the first time they really try and hold to this idea, which of course is impossible that that, uh, that politicians should be so incredibly uh, authentically virtuous. Like it's a very tough call to live up to. Anyway, so this is David again. I'm sure you will know the picture on the right. This is the Mara who's been assassinated mm -hmm. by Charlotte Corday. Uh, on the left, uh, this is uh, another revolutionary who was assassinated. His name was Le Pelletier who was assassinated after he voted for the execution of the king by a royalist who stabbed him in a restaurant. And uh, it only exists in, in this uh, uh, engraved form now because Le Pelletier's daughter um, destroyed it <laughs> later on because she was embarrassed about, about that, the politics. Okay, so it only exists in that form. But originally, these two paintings hung in the convention. And they hung uh, to either side of the president's uh, chair. So sort of at the back there and there, which meant that as the deputies sat, kind of looking on, waiting for their turn to speak, they could see these images of these dead politicians. And I think it's very, very powerful because it shows you that, you know, literally they're naked, you know, their, their vulnerable flesh has been sacrificed, their blood has been shed for the patri. And the message there, the unmistakable message is that the deputies themselves should be willing to do the same. It's a very, very strong image of self-sacrifice. You know, it, he was a great propagandist, studied, but it's also it's, it's quite a disturbing image, I think. I mean, imagine if you have that in Parliament now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, really quite powerful. Okay. So, so much has been said about Robespierre's politics of virtue. Uh, certainly virtue meant a great deal to Robespierre, but he was not the originator of this idea, far from it. And as I've argued in the previous work, the language of political virtue developed during the 18th century partly as a way of critiquing old regime politics. With the onset of the revolution, it developed into an ideological imperative, underpinning ideas about the ways in which the new revolutionary politics should be practised. Now, it wasn't only Jacobins who believed that politicians should be motivated by political virtue. This idea was part of a, a culture common to many people of varying political persuasions. Yet the Jacobins bought heavily into this ideology and they were to pay a high price for it. Uh, and obviously there's a lot more to be said about that. And you know, if you want to ask me, I can say that it's Robespierre as it were today. So, um, but many people were using this language of virtue uh, Robespierre certainly identified strongly with it, and he was what we would call a conviction politician. This was the thing about Robespierre, everybody has agreed on that, that he was the kind of person who seemed to believe what he said. Uh, unless, of course, you disagreed with what he said, in which case he was, he was a sort of devious Machiavellian uh, would-be dictator. But his supporters... Uh, believed in the authenticity of his devotion to virtue. And it's this authenticity which gives so much credibility to his political identity. That is, it wasn't just he talked the talk of virtue, because lots of those deputies were talking that talk. It was how you talked, it was how you got on. The thing about Robespierre is that he had credibility. And as other revolutionaries, more moderate ones like Mirabeau or um, de la Met or Barnard became exposed as kind of ambitious for themselves, and their, their, their kind of their political credibility went down. So Robespierre's star began to rise because people thought this guy actually he's for real. 
And the thing they said about him, of course, was that he was incorruptible. Yeah. And he, yeah, he absolutely was. Everybody agrees, and I think it's certainly true. And certainly, as far as money is concerned, he could not be bought. There's not many politicians, again, you could say that of. You know, I get Francois Fillon, and he'd have loved it if people had called him incorruptible. You know, that election might have gone very differently. Yeah. It's a rare quality in politics. Okay, so nearly 40 years after it played a notable part in the revolution as a conventionnel, a staunch Jacobin, and a regicide, René Levasseur published his memoirs. He'd been one of the Jacobin deputies who sat in the convention, occupying seats high up and known collectively as the Mountain, because they, they sat so high up, um, and individually as the Mountaineers, the Montagnac. Recalling the days of the terror, Levasseur claimed that the Jacobins, who had been so implicated in directing the terror, themselves also experienced the fear that this terror could be turned against them. He said, the terror that we inspired crept over the benches of the mountain as it did into the hotel of the Faubourg Saint-Germain. It sat on the benches of the tribunal, the revolutionary tribunal, and taught its members that they could at any moment change from the role of judge to that of the accused. So what he's painting there is a picture of, as it were, people dealing out terror, but also terrorised at the same time. Now, we may be tempted to dismiss uh, Levasseur's image as overdrawn or a plea for sympathy. He's writing his memoirs long after the event. He wants people to kind of feel some sympathy for him to justify himself. Certainly he did that. Um, uh, but he was also describing a phenomenon that many Jacobin leaders actually experienced. A surprisingly high number of those who directed the legalised recourse to terror in the year two actually perished from it. I mean, that's quite accurate. Now, this fact has long been known, but historians have tended to overlook it, or if they do remark upon it, to underestimate its significance. Um, but in fact, of the 749 deputies of the National Convention, 86 met a violent death before the convention ended. 86. Most of them under the guillotine, a few of them by their, their own hand to, to escape public execution. Moreover, nearly a third of the deputies, 220 out of that 749, uh, were imprisoned at some point whilst they were serving as deputies. Uh, some of them, in fact, quite a large number, after the fall of Robespierre. So this politician's terror didn't end with the death of Robespierre, it changed in character. Um, so as you can see, the attrition rate amongst revolutionary politicians was quite high. And a high proportion of those killed were the most prominent ones, the most prominent members of the convention, the leaders, the great orators, the one who's, ones who spoke a great deal. And the great majority of the deaths were amongst people who have been current members of the Jacobin Club, or like the Girondin group, had been members, previously been members of the Jacobin Club. That is, they, they come from quite a small, close-knit group of politicians at the top, uh, as it were, of the... Um, the peak of politics. So why were these trials of political leaders so ruthless? Well, my book argues that a key factor was mutual fear on the part of the protagonists. From March 1793, the deputies of the convention lost their immunity from arrest, which meant that they could be arrested while still standing as deputies. The only uh, thing that was necessary to get them uh, arrested was that the deputies of the convention had to agree to their arrest to, to vote for it. So your fellow deputies, were they so minded, whether because they disliked you, or they thought you were a genuine conspirator, or even out of fear for themselves, could vote for your arrest. So it was a very um, disturbing situation. There's also a practice of denunciation, which itself was interwoven with a rhetoric on virtue. Now, fear was not the only motive for the trials of the factions, of course, and it has to be factored in alongside many other motives, ideological, tactical, personal. I'm certainly not saying this was all about fear, but what I am saying is that fear was a factor and we should not overlook it. And much of what seems <coughs> irrational makes more sense if we look at it in terms of the emotions that people are feeling. Uh, the revolutionary leaders who put fellow revolutionaries on trial, some of whom were their former colleagues, some of whom were their former friends, were motivated partly by the suspicion of factions and disunity, which they thought of as conspiratorial, 
but in many cases they also acted out of a genuine conviction that political opponents were at best financially and politically corrupt and at worst in league with the foreign powers. And yet there was this other factor of fear, and it's the fear, I argue, that makes the perpetrators so very pitiless in their handling of the factions. They were under pressure from all sides and vulnerable to denunciation themselves, both from the Paris popular militants, the sans culottes, and their leaders, and from other deputies in the convention itself. They were also well aware that if a, uh, a fellow revolutionary leader returned acquitted from the revolutionary tribunal, which had happened with Marat be be in, um, uh, before the Gendarmes, then the first thing he was liable to do was use all his political power and influence to get revenge upon the men that put him there. So it was, it was a nasty business, is what I'm saying. A very nasty and underlying business. The politicians' terror was also a horribly intimate terror. It was carried out for the most part within a relatively small group of people who already knew one another, many of whom were former friends. And it was in these factional trials that the Jacobin leaders themselves played a direct role. So this is what's different. One thing that's different about the politicians' terror, they intervene in this. They uh, intervene in the legal process and in taking part, they're actively choosing to deploy terror. They were the accusers, they were witnesses to the conduct of the, of the accused, they wrote the narrative of virtue and conspiracy. And ironically, the accused also shared the same view of revolutionary politics, one based on the idea of guilt or the innocence of revolutionary leaders. And most of the men, it was almost all men uh, who were involved at, at this kind of level, um, had denounced other people and sometimes put, you know, had got other people put before the Revolutionary Tribunal who tried to do so before they themselves ended up there. So it's, it's really a horrible thing on all sides. Now some of this politician's terror was conducted in a cynical way, as a way of removing political enemies. Yet there was also more to it than that. The politician's terror also pointed to an inner anxiety about other people's motives, the difficulty of reading what was really in someone else's heart, and it's therefore a subject that reveals a whole area of the emotional as well as the ideological history of the terror. So that's what I call politician's terror. In the rest of my paper, what I want to do is give an example of uh, the politician's terror in action in uh, a series of events that certainly involved uh, Robespierre, but also various people uh, who were or had been close to him. And this is the so-called Danton affair. Georges Danton, whom you all, you all very familiar with, yeah? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mind saying who it is if, you, if you're not for sure. Okay, we're all good. Right. Okay, so in the rest of my paper, I'm going to illustrate the development of the politician's terror using an example from the time when it was reaching its height, from November 1793, and looking at the events leading up to one of the most notorious trials of the revolution, that of Danton, Desmoulins, the so-called Dantonist, and several other deputies, along with the other men uh, who were put on trial along with them as part of what was termed the foreign plot. Okay, here is uh, Danton. He looks, I'm sorry to say, not very like Gérard de in the film, uh, which I think for many people remains yeah, the, the iconic sort of image of Danton. Um, and there also Camille Desmoulins, who um, uh, you may also know, who, who, who was a kind of a bit of a sort of a um, hopeless would-be lawyer before the revolution, and yet with the revolution he makes his name as a journalist and kind of comes into his own and um, is a terrific writer, uh, but also is the kind of man who never knows when to shut up, which I must say for, for his story that makes him quite interesting because he says things that other people are careful not to say, but for his own life it made his life very, very precarious. The trial of the Dantonis became one of the most iconic moments of the revolution and was often the subject of literary and theatrical retellings. For many observers since the revolution, the Danton affair epitomised the dark part of the French revolutionary terror, and dramatists and novelists have frequently depicted this. So uh, Buchner's uh, Danton's death, uh, Vida's film, uh, which, is, which uh, Danton, which itself was from a play by a, uh, a Polish writer which actually took a very different uh, view of the politics. Uh, Hilary Mantel, if any of you are into her, um, her novel, uh, God, I've forgotten the blank, what's it called? Mm -hmm. yeah, Place of Greater Safety, that one, yeah, was, was, about, was about these events. And other writers have written a 
about it also. I mean, it, people come back to this again and again because it's such a kind of compelling story. Uh, one of the most compelling things about it is that Danton and especially Demelin have been friends of Robespierre. And then he turns on them. So it's seen as like personal betrayal, which it was, um, but also as something that kind of stands for something else. And it, it, has, it has a lot of kind of uh, baggage with it, this story. So um, the trial of Danton and uh, the people with him has frequently been equated with show trials under 20th century totalitarian dictatorships. So when I mention it, people always start talking about Stalin and say, oh, it's just like Stalin. And I actually don't think it was quite like Stalin, but I, I can talk about that if you want to ask me about it later. But let's leave Stalin out of it. What I want to show here is the extent to which fear, exacerbated by the politicians' terror, was a factor in these climactic events. That is, fear on the part of the Dantonists themselves, but also on the part of the men who attacked them and put them in the dock, including Robespierre himself. Now, the problem, I would say, lies partly with the high expectations of men in political power, this problem of virtue, again, which they took so very seriously. And uh, from the early summer of 1793, after the overthrow of the Girondins, the uh, Jacobins, the, the sorry, Montagnard, when they're in the convention, don't want to confuse you, sorry, this group, are, are in power themselves. Well, they, they hold considerable sway, not power, but considerable sway within the convention. And with political power comes a responsibility, but also comes opportunities. Opportunities. And um, the Jacobins were meant to be like uh, the uh, Roman uh, general, Cincinnatus, who, who, who was, was, was kind of glorified for having accepted responsibility out of love for the public good, not for personal glory. Um, someone who didn't take advantage of his position to extend favouritism and patronage to his friends or to destroy his personal enemies, who kept his hands out of the public purse and didn't abuse his power by setting himself up as a dictator, and who, when it was all over, and retired back to country life in order to lead the, the sort of the perfect life. That was how a revolutionary, virtuous politician was meant, in theory, to be. Uh, but did such men of virtue actually um, exist? That's part of the problem. The Jacobin leaders were subject to constant public scrutiny, and, and you, know, you can't understand anything about them if you don't understand that they are constantly being watched and watching themselves and watching one another. They feared judgment by the sans culottes, the Paris militants. Um, in 1793, a lot of that judgment came from women. Uh, militants, because a lot of the male song you lot, the genuine ones, had enlisted to go and fight in the, in the, uh, in the external wars. So women took on a lot of these roles themselves. Um, women couldn't vote, they couldn't be active citizens in that sense, but they could take on this role in policing the integrity of revolutionary leaders. And uh, here, uh, this is a petition to the convention by a particularly radical group of revolutionary women, the Society of Revolutionary Republican Women, in August 1793, expressing their dissatisfaction with their leaders for their lack of virtue. And believe us, legislators, four years of misfortune have taught us enough to know how to discern ambition, even under the cloak of patriotism. We no longer believe in the virtue of these men who are reduced to praising themselves. Finally, more than words are necessary if we are to believe that ambition does not rule your committees. So there are the women at a moment when the, the popular militants have, have a real hold over the, uh, over the Jacobins, and there they are challenging the Jacobin leaders, saying, are you really, are you really, you know, that moral as you say you are, are you really without personal ambition? Are you really keeping your hands out of the till? We don't believe it. Uh, it, I mean, and, and it's something that really can be taken quite literally. I mean, people were uh, accused. Yeah, ambition could be something that could, if you were convicted of, of being too ambitious, could actually get you killed in the year two if you're a revolutionary politician. And um, what politician do you know who is not ambitious? It's, it's a kind of contradiction in terms. In the autumn of 1793, two new factions formed amongst the um, Jacobins. These become known respectively as the Ebertis or Cordelier, 
after their leader, uh, Adair, who, um, who um, wrote the journal Le Père du Chêne, was kind of self-appointed spokesman of the, of the, the Sans-Culottes, and also the Dantonis, um, named after Georges Danton. Both these factions, for different reasons, opposed the rule of the committees. Now, when I say the committees, that's the Committee of Public Safety, on which Robespierre was sitting by the summer of 1793, made up of 12 members, so he's one of those 12. And increasingly, the Committee of Public Safety is, is, is beginning to um, amass uh, power. And there's also another committee, the Committee of General Security, which is the uh, in charge of police and the prisons. So these committees are, uh, of all the committees that the Convention has, these two are being challenged by uh, Hébert and Danton and their groups. Now, Hébert was, uh, as I said, self-appointed spokesman for the sans-culottes, so he's talking about that there should be more de forcible de Christianization, there should be more terror. Um, but Hébert was also personally resentful that he hadn't been rewarded as well as he had hoped by a senior post in the new regime. You know, he expected his payoff for being the Jacobin, and he felt he hadn't got it. And he was also personally at loggerheads with Danton and with uh, Demelin, who uh, they become personal enemies. Now, the Dantonists were pursuing the reverse policy. They wanted the terror to be wound down and the power of the sans culottes to be curbed. From late 1793, the Dantonists were calling for a policy of clemency and amnesty towards counter-revolutionaries. And this is very interesting because, of course, Danton and Demelin in particular have been strong advocates of terror and were you know, high up there on the mountain. Now, the, the Danton had been sitting on the Committee of Public Safety earlier. He left it in July 1793 as Robespierre entered. These men have been very much implicated um, in that policy of uh, terror. But now it seems that they wanted out. Now, uh, Danton has been said to be um, their leader, uh, but he did not play, in fact, a very prominent public role in the faction's activities. As far as he could, he remained in the background. And members of Danton's faction included his close and trusted friends. Most of them had reputations for financial corruption. And this was the thing about Danton. Everybody said, rude, that he was financially corrupt. Was he financially corrupt? Yes. Pretty much, definitely. Uh, yeah, he, he lived. He lived much better than he should have done on on the income he was supposed to have. But the assumption was also that because he was financially corrupt, he might therefore be politically corrupt. That is, he might have been bought by royalist agents or agents of, of Pitt, who was kind of believed to be like the power who was trying to overthrow the Jacobins and throw gold at the Jacobins and overturn the revolution. So this this was a big kind of fear that people had. So let's just say that a lot of Danton's friends had a reputation as being financially corrupt, which basically meant they liked a good time and they accepted bribes, probably, but unlike uh, Robespierre. And yet these people had been friends. So Danton's faction included uh, Camille Demelin and also Fabre de Glantine, a poet, actor, and now revolutionary. Now, it's very hard to say uh, with certainty exactly what Danton's motives in opposing the Committee of Public Safety were. Um, stories of his uh, corruption circulated for a long time. But Robespierre should be noted up until December of 1793, so that's about March. That's... Um, three and a half months before he turned on Danton, still defending him openly in the convention and, and denying that, that um, uh, Danton had a bad, um, a bad habit of taking money. Danton's really quite a difficult person to um, research, I have to say, because he was the kind of man who didn't leave anything, anything lying around that could incriminate him. So for a historian, that's really quite hard work. And also after his death, many people had a vested interest in destroying any kind of incriminating stuff. So that whole murky stuff about what Danton was really about is very, very difficult to try and disentangle. Um, I mean, there are almost no letters from him, almost none at all. So it's curious, curious. whereas uh, Demelin, on uh, hundreds and hundreds of letters, never stopped writing. Um, so people continued to speculate about uh, Danton's financial corruption, and some of them said that because of this, he was also politically corrupt. Um, but the evidence whether he was politically corrupt, whether he really had been bought by, say, the British or French royalists, is circumstantial and much less conclusive. None of it was actually presented at his trial. 
Um, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that you take taken bribes. There's some suggestion you might have taken bribes to save the king and the, and the queen, but obviously didn't save them back to the guillotine. Um, but we don't really know for sure. But he was always a bit of an adventurer. Right. In late 1793, Danton's close friend, Fabre, the actor, came to the committees with a tale of conspiracy on a scale that outstripped anything they'd hitherto imagined, and he convinced them of its reality. And what he told them was the story of the foreign plot. According to Fabre, some of the most extreme Jacobins were in the pay of the British government, and they were attempting to discredit and destroy the Republic by proposing ever more violent and destabilising measures. So they were basically trying to give the revolution a bad name by being, by being ultra-violent, ultra-extreme. And Fabre accused men who were part of the uh, network of Hebert in the Cordelier Club of being in on this um, conspiracy. Right. So this is what becomes the foreign plot. Um, other people, the, the Fabre's here on the right. Um, and this is another man who became entangled in it. His name is Chabot, who had been on the Committee of General Security and um, was um, uh, also um, involved in corruption charges. And both of them told stories. Uh, and both of them were doing it to try and save themselves. Um, in the case of Fug, he'd been involved in uh, a financial scam, uh, falsifying shares of the East India Company in order to make money and his signatures on the document. So it's, it's known that he was, he was involved in the scam. And he seems to have been very frightened that this would come to light. And this probably was, had a lot to do with his decision to go to the committees and denounce this foreign plot. So kind of deflect attention from himself by denouncing other people. Chabot, in a sense, was a bit similar. He, he had, the, he, there was a lot of um, a conspiracy, a corruption, uh, uh, charges around him, and he also went to Robespierre with, with a huge sum of money which he's only given him to bribe the Jacobins. And so these men, and they both get imprisoned eventually, and they're both terrified for themselves and making lots of allegations. Now, a lot of the material for this has gone missing, and you kind of think, well, probably people who were in on corruption anyway had a vested interest in making sure it went missing. So, for example, Chabot's interrogation hasn't been seen, I think, since 1795. You know, somebody just <laughs> shredded it, 18th century equivalent. Okay. So we don't know exactly what was going on. Um, certainly Fab's um, motives in concocting this tale about the foreign plot were unedifying, but like so much that happened in the year two, I think he was driven by fear, and um, he was afraid, as I said. Um, and he also had the air of authenticity about him. As I said, he was an actor. So presumably he was very plausible when he made up this story. But this was something that Robespierre comes back to. When, when, when it it's, um, becomes obvious that Fab has in fact lied, um, Robespierre keeps on and on when the guy was an actor. He was, he was a fake, he, was, you know, he wasn't authentically virtuous. Now one of the principal questions for us is whether there was any substance to the corruption and foreign plot allegations, but we're unlikely ever to have a definitive answer. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that, yes, money was being sort of floating around in Paris in the, in the spring of 1794, and attempts were being made to um, buy off some leading Jacobins. But what is not evident, and I think was almost certainly not happening, is, is this notion that the extremists on the left, the Ebertists, were actually secretly in league with the Dantonists on the right and all trying to discredit the revolution together, which is the story that Robespierre and the committee members finally came to accept. This idea of a, a concerted plot as opposed to some rather messy um, corruption uh, that was going on. So much of the narrative of the, for of the foreign plot was ev evidently a fabrication. Yet as an insight into Jacobin thinking, these conspiracy fears are highly significant. And most importantly, much of Jacobin politics at this time needs to be understood in relation to conspiracy, both real conspiracies and imagined conspiracies. An uncertainty over the identity of the enemy within is perhaps the most difficult thing of all. That is, if there was a foreign plot and some Jacobins were in league with the foreign powers, who were they? Who were the men who, who had the, the fake identity, as it were, who were really um, in league with the foreign powers? 
And I think the traumatic events of the year two and the way in which the Jacobins tore one another apart can't be understood without an appreciation that this fear of conspiracy was genuine, all-encompassing, and had some basis in reality. Now, for the Dantonis, their attack on the committees and their attempt to establish uh, a policy of clemency, that is, winding down the terror, had its most articulate defender in Camille Demelin, the journalist, yeah, who wrote a new newspaper, Le Vieux Codier. He calls it Le Vieux Codier because he himself had been a member of the Cordelier Club back in the day, back when the revolution first began. And so we're calling his, his general Le Vieux Codier. What he's saying is, I was the, the original Cordelier. I was the real one, the authentic revolutionary. Um, and I, I'm telling it like it is, I can be trusted. And these people coming up now in the Cordelier Club, Eber and his group, they're, they're fake Cordelier, they're not real revolutionaries. And that's so it's just an image of the proofs, uh, of his, his hand corrections on the proofs of one of the issues of his journal. Uh, now this uh, newspaper became increasingly outspoken against the policy of terror. And there's some really powerful stuff in it. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's really, uh, bits of it have been translated into English. So even if you don't read the French, you can read some bits of it. And it's the most amazing thing. A very powerful defense of liberty of the press. Um, um, his uh, attack on the Committee of Public Safety, which he says is, has this sort of rule by fear, which he links to the law of suspects and says that nobody dares say the truth because they're all so frightened of what might happen to them. Um, and his, his, his amazing sort of statement that uh, that terror doesn't work, that for every sort of you know every person that you kill, you create ten more enemies. You know the friends and family of the people, person that you kill, and these people never forgive you. Terror cannot work. Fantastic stuff. Um, but it's also full of really petty and nasty and vindictive and savage accusations against other revolutionaries. I mean they're complicated people, particularly against Ebert. Uh, who, uh, with whom uh, Demar had a bit of a personal war going on. So Demar uh, accuses of uh, corruption of being an agent of royalists. And one of the things uh, Demar said, I will unmask you as I unmasked Brissot. Brissot was the leader of the Gironde, whom uh, Demar previously denounced. Now, um, Demar was, in undertaking this kind of brave, one might almost say foolhardy, um, uh, enterprise of writing this journal was taking a big risk because he was attacking the committees. And um, he's relying in great part on his friendship with Robespierre, his personal friendship with Robespierre. Now Robespierre had defended uh, Demar up to a certain point and he also read the first two issues of the Vieux Cordier in proof before publication. Uh, before he took fright, basically, and, and drew back from his endorsement. In the um, December 1793, uh, Demelin came under attack in the Jacobin Club. The Jacobins said he was, he was basically a traitor, a conspirator. He defended himself by claiming, I was always the first to denounce my own friends. It's really horrible, it's really horrible. From the moment, I mean, he's right, actually. He did denounce a lot of people. That is actually true. Uh, yeah. I was always the first to denounce my own friends. And the moment that I realised that they were conducting themselves badly, not acting virtuously, yeah. I resisted the most dazzling offers, and I stifled the voice of friendship that their great talents had inspired in me. So virtue comes before friendship. That's what he's saying. Yeah? You think of the Brutus image again. I put virtue, the good of the, the salut public, you know, the public welfare, before anything else, before friendship. So what he's saying is, I was a good revolutionist. It's really terrifying stuff. And he's saying it because he's afraid, obviously. That's, that's what I put to you, you know, because he's also writing the Vieux Cordier, which is arguing something very different. But he's, he's personally afraid. And he has reason to be. Um, so as I say, Robespierre had defended uh, Danton up to a point, Demelin as long as he dared. But things all came into a head in the Jacobin Club on the 8th of January 1794, when Demelin took to the Tribune once again to respond to denunciations made against him. And Robespierre tried once more to extricate Demelin and said that, that Demelin's problem was his choice of friends. 
kind of hung out with the wrong people, and he was kind of, you know, good, good, good hearted but uh, impetuous. And Robespierre suggested that Demelin um, make amends by burning the Vieux Courrier, the newspaper. They had a, a little brazier um, uh, in the Jacobin Club. And he said, we can put this newspaper in the brazier, burn that stuff, forget all about it. And uh, Demelin turned to Robespierre and said, um, burning is not an answer which was paraphrasing uh, Rousseau, whom um, uh, Robespierre greatly admired. Uh, but it was also, what it was doing was showing up Robespierre in front of the Jacobin Club and challenging Robespierre really to defend Demelin, to put friendship for Demelin before his own image as a man of integrity and virtue. And Robespierre publicly retracted his defense of Demelin. He said, well, he said, um, if that, if this is what you want, then you, know, you, you can answer the charges. And it's not, Brave of Robespierre, you know, but it's it's kind of it's all taking place, and I think yes, this this horrible atmosphere. Um, in fact, later on, uh, when there is an attempt to expel Demelin again from the Jacobin Club, and um, which would have been automatic death sentence, Robespierre again defended uh, Demelin, but in, a, in an oblique way by saying, "Well, we shouldn't discuss individuals." But it was understood that what uh, Robespierre was really saying is that uh, Demelin should not be expelled from the Jacobin Club. Um, and we know something about this from a letter written by Demelin's panic-stricken wife, Lucie Demelin, at the time, um, when she was writing to a fellow revolutionary. And she described how Robespierre, as she said, over two consecutive days railed at, or rather cried out against Camille, her husband, they all called him Camille. Yet when Demelin's expulsion was decreed, she says, by a truly bizarre stroke, Robespierre made inconceivable efforts to have Demelin reinstated. He succeeded, but in the course of that struggle, she says, quoting again, when he didn't think or act according to the will of a certain number of individuals, he did not have all power. And so what she's saying there is that even in the Jacobin Club, Robespierre's power had its limits, and he was frightened to push further within the club and to show himself to be putting his friendship uh, with Demelin before his kind of his, his political integrity. As for Danton, Lucie continued, she said, they no longer listen to him, he loses courage, he grows weak. It's all very grim. Um, and it's shortly after this that Robespierre made a speech on the moral principles that should guide the convention in February 1794. And uh, part of this speech includes um, a passage about virtue and terror, which is always being quoted when people talk about Robespierre. Virtue and terror, he says, support one another and they are necessary to establish the revolution. So in time of extreme crisis, you have to have virtue and terror. Uh, virtue, he says, because, uh, sorry, terror, he says, because otherwise the virtuous men, the good men, the good public spirited uh, politicians will be overthrown. So they need the power of terror. But virtue is also necessary because otherwise terror is just crime. So they have to be well-intentioned. So this, is, this is so often being quoted, and, and obviously you can, you can think of many kind of contemporary parallels, but this is something Robespierre did. And, and what he's doing really is he's becoming an apologist for the tariff. And you know, this is one of the reasons why. Just... Which particular, I mean, what? The, the, the political, I mean, infighting, the, the terror you're talking about, or is it the terror in the world? In the, the wider French society. Oh, I see what you mean. That's a good question. Actually, as I've said, I've got it up here on the, on the PowerPoint. The second part of the speech is a veiled attack on the two factions. That is the indulgence or the dontonis and the cordelier. Mm. And so, what he seems to be doing here, really, is talking about it in relation to their own people and to putting to putting, um, as it were, um, the public good before their own people, rather than a wider terror. There's a whole debate about whether the Jacobins. Um, language of terror really meant terror, which I can talk about in the questions, but I'll never get into the paper if I do. So, but please do ask. It's a really good question. Obviously, it's an important question. I think. Come back to that. 
Okay, so what he's arguing here is that both the ultra-revolutionaries, the, the sort of extreme left ones, I suppose we put it, and the moderate ones, the Dantonese, are all secretly part of the foreign plot in league with one another and looking to overthrow the committees, with the Committee of Public Safety holding the line of authentic revolution. Um, for several months, Robespierre had resisted killing Danton. He doesn't seem to have finally agreed to, to the pressure from the other committee members until about 10 days before Danton's death. We don't know for sure, but it does look like it was really, really late. We do know that Robespierre resisted it for a long time because on the 9th of Thermidor, uh, when he was denounced and overthrown, one uh, fellow member of the Committee of Public Safety, Bio Varenne, leapt up and said that the first time that he himself, Bio Varenne, had said that Danton should be arrested uh, and uh, put on trial and executed. Robespierre leapt up like a madman and said, you want to kill the best patriots and kind of refused to do it. So we know from that that he did resist for quite a long time and Bio Varenne actually held it against Robespierre. So he doesn't seem to have caved in until really shortly before the arrest of Danton and um, Demelin. Uh, it seems likely that Danton will not accept Robespierre's efforts to broker a compromise with the committees and keep quiet. And it may be that Danton was partly thinking of how he could defend his friend, Favre, who was by this point was in prison, because Danton was the kind of person who did stick by his friends, which is one of the, part of the reason why he seems more likeable. It's certainly a lot more likeable because he's not the kind of man who put virtue before friendship. Um, the first intimation that Denmark had that the net was closing in on him was when Robespierre rejected a private appeal to their formal friendship. Um, Denmark said to a friend, I'm done for, I've been to call on Robespierre and he's refused to see me. When they finally agree, however, to the arrest of the Dantonis, um, there can be no question that these men are to be killed. And when Robespierre does turn, he turns absolutely and becomes a leading uh, mover in the process of uh, arresting Danton. Uh, first of all, Saint Just, who is like um, uh, 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 Robespierre, kind of loyal, a sidekick, as it were. That point, um, Saint Just had written a kind of draft speech to denounce Danton and Demelin, but Robespierre thought it wasn't it wasn't weighty enough, so he wrote notes, helpful notes that the daughter, that could be used to denounce his former friends Danton and Demelin. And because Robespierre had known for a long time, he knew you know your friends. If your friends turn on you, they know they know, they know where the bodies are buried. Absolutely, <laughs> that's absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, so he actually wrote these notes, and you know they're there, and we can see them. And the committees eventually took the precaution of arresting Danton and Demelin and the others before denouncing them, so that they weren't, you know, arrested by the authority of the convention. They'd already been found out because Danton was such a great speaker. They didn't dare. They didn't dare. They were too frightened to give him a chance to defend himself. And. Um, Sanchez so then, you know, the, the, the guys are under arrest. Um, Robespierre has said, you know, anybody who defends them is them, themselves a, you know, a conspirator. And everybody shuts up and sits down and says, yeah, okay. And listens to Sanchez, who came on and gave the official denunciation of the Dantonis. And this is what he said. Well, we should all think that there's this one line from it. Those people who for four years have conspired under the veil of patriotism, now that justice is closing in on them, repeat the words of Vernier. Vernier was one of the Girondin leaders now uh, dead. And Vernier had said, the revolution is like Saturn, it will devour its own children. If they are repeated these words during his trial, they are repeated by all those who tremble as they see themselves unmasked. No. The revolution will not devour its children, but its enemies, no matter with what impenetrable mask they have concealed themselves. Were the conspirators who perished the children of liberty because for a moment they resembled them? Again, really chilling. Um, and this phrase, Saturn's children, that's what I'm going to call my next book. Mm -hmm. About these men, because I just think that's just amazing. Okay. I'm going to um, wind up a couple of moments, because I think we've had long enough here. This is um, uh, an image from Danton um, having been put on trial, and um, basically it was it was a travesty of justice. Uh, 
one of the witnesses, again, a fellow revolutionary who knew Danton very well, was waiting to give evidence, and, um, and, uh, and Danton kind of shouted at him, do you actually believe that we're conspirators? And this man, Conway, laughed. He it taken him back and he laughed. And Danton said, look at you, you laugh. This is ridiculous. How can I be a conspirator? Write down that you laughed. But of course, they didn't want to, to write anything down. It was absolutely, you know, it was a trial about killing these men once they were arrested. Um, so Danton, along with several of the deputies and other people who'd been accused of financial corruption, kind of put together to make the corruption charges look kind of more plausible, they're all tried as being part of the foreign plot. And amongst the people tried and convicted was Fab, Danton's friend, the man who had devised the story of the foreign plot in the beginning and had denounced one or two of the men who were actually alongside him in the dock. It's all very, very horrible. This image here is of Danton, as you can see, and he's having been prepared for his execution. He's being led off to the guillotine and looking defiant to the end. Uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to, he's supposed to have said to the executioner, don't forget to show my head to the people. It's worth it. That's where I'm going to stop.